Thank you so much, everyone, again. As stewards of the earth, we have the responsibility to honor and respect the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, and all of the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We honor all of the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people who have been living on the land since time immemorial, and we recognize their leadership in protecting and caring for Mother Earth. In Burlington, our work with the community takes place within the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, represented by Treaty 14 and 19 and on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Attawandurong, Haudenosaunee, and Métis people. We honor these rightful caretakers of this sacred land surrounding the Great Lakes, and we are grateful for their teachings. We are each encouraged to continually learn from and about the Indigenous community where we live and how we can meaningfully honor the calls to action for truth and reconciliation. Just a very quick um, little tutorial. So um, the chat, which we are working on right now so that you'll be able to use, um, is there if you would like to um, use that. And the Q&A section as well, so that throughout the event, as Kyle is presenting, or maybe you are just inspired in that moment and you can feel a question arising within you, you can feel free to submit those questions. And then we will uh, hopefully have time at the end to answer just as many of those questions as we can. We have a free native species tree, courtesy of the city of Burlington, that we're going to be giving away. Everyone in attendance will be entered into a draw for a chance to win. The name will be pulled after the event and the lucky winner will be advised via email where to collect their wonderful tree. So this is limited um, to the winner has to be able to collect the tree from us this Saturday at the TLC event. Um, so mostly for Burlington residents, but if you are able to come in and pick it up from us on Saturday, um, we would really appreciate that. Um, if the winner does not wish to receive the tree, um, then we will contact the next selected name of the attendee list and so on. Maybe you don't have a space on your property, or maybe you just don't trust yourself to take care of it. Um, either one is applicable. Um, I'm seeing some questions in the Q&A, so I know that the um, question answer is working. Um, however, I'm just going to clarify, the question is when will the attendance be here? And I'm not quite sure what that question means. So if you could submit another question, just clarifying what you mean, um, I will happily answer that question for you. So to get things started, we'd love to keep things as interactive as possible, uh, which is why we're including the Q&A in tonight's event. But we also have a little poll for all of you just to get things started. Um, so I'm going to launch that poll. It's only two questions um, and should be ready to go and launch on your screen now. Wow, we have about six more people still to answer. Seven more people still to contribute. Have you ever planted a tree before? Question number one. And was the tree planted a native species to Ontario? I'll give everyone a few more seconds. Four more people still to answer. I'll give you guys 15 more seconds. Maybe you just have to look up what the tree was so you can figure out if it was native or not. Uh, 
All right, I'm going to share the results. So it's pretty even on the first one. We have about half of us having planted a tree and half of us not having planted a tree before. Four yeses, excellent. Okay, excellent to know. Thank you so much. Good question, Kyle, in the chat. To those who weren't sure if their tree was native, what tree did you plant? All right, well, thank you so much for um, doing that poll and participating in that for us. Um, and I did receive this sort of clarification to that question. Um, uh, um, and it was um, a youth network question, so I will just follow up with that after. So it is my pleasure to introduce Kyle McLaughlin. Um, for those of you who haven't met Kyle before, let me give you a bit of an introduction. Kyle McLaughlin has delivered numerous workshops and lectures on plant pathology and the relationship between trees and fungus. He is the City of Burlington's uh, Supervisor of Forest Planning and Health and owner and principal arborist of Ironwood Arboricultural Solutions. He has practiced arboriculture in Canada, the United States, and Australia. Before becoming an arborist, Kyle was a wilderness guide. Kyle kindly joined us for our first Ask an Arborist last year, and we are thrilled to have him back with us tonight to share a presentation about native trees and why they are important for strengthening local biodiversity and for action on climate. Kyle's gonna take over and present until about 8 p.m. or maybe a bit sooner, um, but I, I know um, there's lots of passion there, so I'm sure Kyle could keep us here till 11 and we would all be wrapped to our screens, uh, but we're gonna try and have the presentation wrapped by eight so we can have lots of time for interaction in the Q and A. Um, so it is my pleasure and honor to pass the screen over um, to Kyle McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Gail. That was, uh, you're too kind. Uh, okay, so make sure I get you the right screen. Okay. Can you see the slideshow? Yes. Excellent. And do you see it with a big black thing around it and the next slide and the notes, or do you just see the slideshow? Just the slideshow. Awesome. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, Kale, for the, the excellent introduction. Um, I, uh, it's funny that you mentioned, I will say, the, uh, the eco, eco Studies program for Aldershot, because uh, back when I was a guide, I actually volunteered with them. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we went to Killarney. Um, and uh, I had an absolute blast. And it was, it, it's the program that I wish existed when I was in high school. Um, so, so cool. I can't speak about it enough. And, and for everybody that's here, uh, I encourage questions even about that, right? Um, so a big part of this idea being an ask me anything, I want to encourage everybody just to ask um, what you have on mind, both for the city of Burlington, I'm going to talk a little bit about urban forestry, uh, but also for just your backyard trees. I, I love the, the challenging questions. We had a couple come through earlier. Somebody had asked about a pawpaw orchard. I'm quite happy. I'm ex very excited to talk about that, to be honest. Um, but I have, what I have with me is actually a slide deck of 60 slides. And uh, that 60 slides for me, I mean, you can already probably tell, I can spend 10 minutes on the title page uh, before we even get anywhere, because there is really a lot to talk about when it comes to trees. But I think the most value that comes out of these experiences is not so much me telling you what I think is amazing. It's using the slideshow just to show you a little bit of what we have and to say, this is this is just the tip of the iceberg and uh, and what we're dealing with on the city side of things and how that relates to all our, our natural environments. Um, so we're talking about native trees today and we'll talk a little bit about what makes something native. Um, but specifically, I want to talk about our urban forest. Now, forestry is a big, big profession. It's a it's a big uh mode of study. And there's a lot of tools, techniques, and approaches to it. Uh, in urban forestry, we're actually looking at what trees in our urban environments do, 
why do we have them? What are we growing them for? Because we're not growing them to cut them down to turn them into products like you would in traditional forestry. The role of us as urban foresters is to maintain trees as living infrastructure, like a light bulb or a street sign or a road or a sidewalk. That's how we approach trees in the urban forest. And ideally the goal is, hopefully, uh, to have a good uh, marriage between the uh, civilization and nature. And it's really, really tough because as we all know, civilization, well, as much as we're products of the, of the planet, uh, civilization isn't the same thing as a natural ecosystem, uh, especially here in the Carolinian forest. And so before we go, just to, just to talk about a couple of things on our uh, on our title page here. So the, on the right, we've got a beautiful native tree, which is your, uh, your northern red oak, Quercus rubra. I use Latin a lot. I use it to actually um, help specify what I'm talking about, because one thing that I learned in my travels, if you only use English names for trees, you can get really confused when you talk to arborists or botanists or biologists from other places, because we use different names for trees, even in the English language. Um, and there's a few that I'll, I'll give you examples of, especially the tulip tree a little bit later, because the tulip tree has some interesting names in the States. Um, in the center there, you can see there's a, a fungal fruiting body. So that's a fistulina hepatica. And that orange circular thing is actually something we call a diameter tape. And that's a very important tool to arborists, urban foresters, and foresters alike. And it's a tool to measure the size of a tree. Um, in our profession, the, the size of the tree is actually measured by its diameter at breast height. And uh, for those who want to learn more about that, I encourage you to ask a question, but I'm not going to dive into it unless people are interested. And then finally, on the right hand side, we've got uh, a photo of a root crown ex excavation, which is something that we did um, for the city, trying to figure out why a tree was dying back. And we actually found out that uh, the majority of the tree, you can see all of that area. Um, let's go back a little bit there. Get the pointer. Perfect. Um, you can see as I draw the pen around, that's where the actual soil line was, and all of this part of the tree, which is supposed to be above ground, was completely covered with soil. And then uh, complicating all of that, the roots, because they were in this environment, started to choke each other out, and unfortunately we lost that tree. And that was, but that was one of our techniques to actually try and save uh, a fairly large mature linden. Now, my background, and thank you, Kale, for the introduction. I'm going to be very quick. Um, both Mac and Humber College, I was an outdoor leadership skills instructor for McMaster years ago. Um, really cut my teeth in the outdoor club there and uh, with outdoor recreation. I learned a whole heck of a lot. Um, did my College of Trades journeyman arborist. So that's the climbing the trees, the starting the chainsaws, the, the real uh, the, it's the real work. It's all work. Um, but the, the labor work on the ground. Um, ISA tree risk assessment qualification, a board certified master arborist now and a municipal specialist. So what this means is that I've basically taken a lot of tests um, and I really <laughs> devote a lot of time into learning because uh, we have to, and especially if we wanna maintain our credentials and every arborist for the city of Burlington is an ISA certified arborist. If we wanna maintain our credentials, we actually have to have continuing education. Um, and that's on a regular cycle. And if you're a board certified master arborist, you have, um, you have a higher, expectation for maintaining your continuing education. Um, final point to that, the ISA, the International Society of Arboriculture, is the main industry body that we use to kind of regulate our industry. There's no legislation, so the government doesn't regulate our boriculture or urban forestry because we're kind of a new trade. Um, we're still kind of finding our way, and we, we walk a fine line between the two. So what is our boriculture and urban forestry? Really the, the end of the day, um, an arboriculture is like a doctor for trees and an urban forester is like a public health professional. Uh, arbor arborists manage individual or small groups of trees in the urban environment. So I'm coming to your house, you have a, a white pine, you're concerned about its health, you're concerned about its structure, or you need to get it pruned. You're gonna go to an arborist and say, what's the, the best approach? And Ideally, you're going to hire an arborist that is professionally qualified and is going to diagnose the problem, not tell you what to do. Um, as, as a homeowner, when you have a tree, the idea is, is that you make the decisions on what to do and the arborist just gives you options. And this is very much the same for those of us who have, have pets. When we go to the vet, the vet doesn't tell us what to do and we don't tell the vet what to do. 
we take the vet and we say, our dog is sick. And the vet says, okay, I'm going to try and figure out what's wrong. And the veterinarian does the tests and then comes back with a diagnosis and says, your dog needs to get its shots or your dog has a cold or your dog's actually okay. He's just a little nervous. Um, and that's your point as the dog owner to say, okay, I'm going to choose to do something with the diagnosis that the veterinarian gives me or not. And that's kind of how arborists should work and most do. Um, and then on the urban forestry side of things, we deal with thousands and thousands of trees. So to give everybody an example, there's a snapshot of our asset management software. This is what we use to manage trees for the city of Burlington. It's a program called Tree Plotter, and it's designed specifically for managing trees on a very large scale. So if you look in the little corner there, it says showing 2,000 of 84,240 sites. That's 84,240 trees that we have in our inventory. These aren't all the trees that we have in the city. These are just trees that we have looked at, done work on, or measured. Right. Um, and in most circumstances, those trees have been picked up through an asset management inventory. So having an arborist go around and measure all of the trees. And with that data or with this data, we can dispatch our crews, we can prioritize emergencies, we can respond to storms, and we can get really valuable data that helps us decide how we manage our forest. And this takes me to our urban forest master plan. So at this point right now, we're going through the process of updating an urban forestry master plan. This is the direction for the city and how uh, the city's urban forest and as a part of it, our woodlots. Now, if you look, there's a couple, uh, a couple links down there at the bottom. Uh, if anybody wants after we pass through uh, to come back to this, I'd be happy to discuss it in greater detail. But this document is meant to use this information to give us information like this, which is, what is our department doing? How, how much time do we have to deal with problems? How, much, how many questions are we getting? And this is actually uh, data straight from the State of the Urban Forest Report. This is, uh, this is all of the calls that we've had over the course of uh, the first half of this year, which is when the report was being written. I'd like to draw everybody's attention to May, which is an, a really interesting one. That was the, the month that we had the storm. Um, to give everybody an idea, that month we had about 600 service requests for, for tree inspection. And this data is really helpful for us because we never could track this before. And urban forestry, is it's really important to do this because we can also do this with our species, which we're going to talk about in a little moment. Um, but the interesting thing about this is it helps to inform council, it helps to inform residents to say, we had 600 requests to prune trees, and we have one inspector for the whole city, which when you figure the math out, if there's 20 working days, that's 30 visits a day with one inspector. Um, you'd be hard pressed to do that. And, and we are, and we are. Uh, but this, this data is really valuable because it helps us decide how do we actually triage our problems with our limited resources? Because it's a, a critical part of what we do. Another thing that came out of the urban forest master or the state of the urban forest report was an understanding of what our canopy actually looks like, right? We talk about climate change. What are we actually doing about it? Because it's, it's really nice to put a, a stamp on something, a nice to put a sticker on something and say, we're being climate active or we're, we're paying attention to what's going on. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is well, we have uh, we have a lot of open space in our canopy, um, and it's not just uh, it, it's not just one problem. It's a multifaceted problem, and we need to address it in a lot of different ways. Part of it is getting buy-in from residents. Uh, that's that includes individual residents uh, and businesses, and a part of it is using our planting dollars wisely and finding good places where trees are actually going to succeed choosing tree species that will succeed, and then making sure that once they're planted, they actually do. Because it's one thing to actually plant a tree, it's another thing to actually care for it and grow it. And what our canopy cover really looks like right now, it's a little tricky because we have really good canopy cover, in a sense. We have 31% coverage, but a lot of it really we get because of the Niagara Escarpment. That's what all this area is here. And I think that's really, really valuable. 
except that it doesn't really bring the great value of that forest to the people that live in this area. And so we need to make better decisions or not better decisions, we are making good decisions, but uh, we need to actually use this data to, to plan where we're headed. And so planning, what's our planting program? Right now, we're actually, this year, our goal is to plant 1,850 trees street side. That's, uh, that includes, that does not include community events, pardon me, because in, in April, we planted 500 trees with Burlington Green. And then there are other extraneous community events where, if, where people will plant trees here and there. We have very limited resources to do that. Um, we really need NGOs to support us. And this is where Burlington Green has been a, a huge, huge help to us. Um, what standards do we have for trees? This is another big one, health or structure. We'll talk about this, especially if, if people want to get into the mature tree question. I love talking about mature trees. Um, my business, which I, I don't really talk about um, and this isn't the focus of this, but uh, is, is mature tree care because it's a different approach. Just like when doctors take care of elderly patients versus um, neonatal or prenatal patients, those are two very different things. And when we're talking about baby trees, managing a baby tree is actually very, very different than managing a mature tree. The physiology is, is different. The species that they interact with is different, are different. And, uh, and so bearing that in mind, it's, uh, it's important that when we talk about our standards, we're looking at both the health of the tree, because the tree is an organism, and the structure of the tree because it's usually or often the, the structure that's the cause for failure in storms, not so much the health. You can have an incredibly healthy tree fail in a storm because of a poor structural issue. And, uh, and we'll leave that one at that. Um, this is Eric. So Eric is in charge of our, uh, our planting program. He's our field services technician. He goes out to every site. Uh, he inspects the trees when the trees come in off of the truck to make sure that they're right, the right species, that they're not too sick, that they're not too bare, that they're, they're fitting or our, our meeting our standards. And uh, sometimes you get species that don't do very well, or sometimes you get specimens that are mislabeled, and it's Eric's job to, to pick that out. Um, and, uh, and finally here, in another interesting piece is uh, there's a, a young tree that was planted. This is actually from Melbourne. Um, it's, a, it's a silver maple, which is a swampy tree, likes a lot of water, was planted in the middle of the summer in Melbourne. And then it wasn't watered for six weeks. And I was hired to diagnose it because I understood the native Canadian trees. I said, yeah, did you guys, have you guys watered it? I'm like, not for like two months, mate. I'm like, well, that's probably the problem probably should water it. Um, and this is often the case with our trees. We need to think of them as ecosystems and we need to think of what does the system need, right? Because the system needs other organisms to survive. And in a case in the city, the trees need us. Uh, but then also you've got all these microscopic organisms that live off of the trees. Um, animals in the urban environment are a bit of the chicken and the egg. Um, because we want to have a robust and biodiverse forest, and that also means a robust and biodiverse um, wildlife, which is a, is a complicated matter because it takes a lot more and a whole other level of skill to manage that. Um, and then the other thing to think about here is that the bark is reflective of the forest surface. So like the duff layer, which is that layer in, in if you go out to Algonquin Park, that like really spongy layer of all of the, the leaves and the needles that have just been sitting there for years and years, the bark is a lot like that too. It's actually, uh, it's actually made out of cork and is, is meant to be an impermeable, uh, impermeable skin almost. And I mean, I'm, we're going to talk a lot about bark tonight, probably. Um, but needless to say, it's a lot cooler than, than it sounds, <laughs> at least as, as, as I'm making it sound. Um, so how are we keeping young trees alive? So some of you that are here are probably getting trees, uh, hopefully getting trees this weekend um, at our tree giveaway. And so the question that I've had from a few folks is how, how do you guys keep your trees alive? How do you do it at the city? Um, so water, right? Water is really important. It can be a really unpredictable cost. It's tough for contractors sometimes because water is really expensive to move. You don't think it is, except when you think about the actual scope of the machinery to move it. And I'll show you one of those in a moment. Um, but then having the right stock beyond that. So do you have the right species for the right place, right? You want to have something that's grown locally, that's native in, in a lot of circumstances, and, and we'll talk about why, it's just used to the native environment. It's, it's genetically used to the winters here and the summers here. Um, 
And then uh, <laughs> one point on uh, on Colorado blue spruce. I, if anybody has a question out there, I encourage it. Most people have a blue spruce or they've got one on their street. Um, that is a perfect example of not ideally grown to the local zone or not ideally suited to this area. Blue spruce, people thought when we started planting them, they would do well here because of our winters, but it doesn't actually do as well as we think or we thought um, because the, the winters in Colorado are very similar to the winters here, but the summers in Colorado are not, right? They're dry and cool here, they're hot and humid. And so it's, it's not the same. And, and we find that this is the case, not just because we see that they're planted in a different location than their local zone, but also because of the diseases that come with them. Um, mycorrhizae is a really interesting one. So mycorrhizae is actually a fungus that bonds with the roots of the trees and helps them connect with moisture in the soil. Uh, important to note that with mycorrhizae, we don't typically plant trees for the city with them, um, or we haven't up until this point. Now I'm, I'm really pushing, we're, we're piloting a few locations where we can do this, because the idea is that mycorrhizae help the trees to recover. Um, catching infestations before planting, so that's important, because once you plant your tree, um, it's, it's not over. It's a lot easier than, say, taking care of a pet, but it still takes work. You need to keep an eye on your tree every week, every two weeks for the first year, because sometimes pests can come out of nowhere. I, I myself had an experience just this year where I planted a yellow birch, was very excited about it. And it's about a year, little over a year old now. I walk out to the side and there were saw flies, which is a common pest um, in the forest and had wiped out the main leader of my tree. So my tree that I was expecting to be by, you know, by the end of this year, three or four feet tall is now only two feet tall. It was stunted that bad. Now it, it's surviving, but it may not long-term. Um, and that's why you want to catch your infestations before you plant. Um, oh, heavens, there we go. Did I lose everyone there? Perfect. Nope. Awesome. Thank you, Kale. I, everything just kind of went funny on me. Um, okay, and then the finally, the species and genus selection. So don't waste time putting the wrong tree in the wrong place. Now, this is, uh, this is an important point, especially for us from a healthcare perspective for the city, right? We're looking at thousands and thousands of trees, and this is the public health side of urban forestry. We want to be able to plant trees that aren't going to get our other trees sick, and part of that is having a wide diversity of species. When we don't have a wide diversity of species, you have things like emerald ash borer, you have things like Dutch elm disease or chestnut blight. And, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about biodiversity in a bit. How can you help new trees? So if you have a new tree on your, uh, on your boulevard planted by the city, we appreciate water. We understand that not everybody wants to water and that's okay. Um, generally speaking, the way with our program, uh, contractors are responsible for the tree for the first two years. And if it dies within those two years, they have to replace it at their cost. And then it, the warranty re restarts. So it's really in their best interest to get it off of two years. And we're lucky that our contractor is actually quite good. They're very diligent and they care, which is nice. You don't always get that. Um, the important thing to note, so you can see, don't volcano mulch the base of trees. It is awful for them. It will drastically shorten the life of the tree. It will stunt the tree. It will confuse the tree. And people say, well, why is that the case? Um, think of bark like your skin. I made that reference a little bit late or a little bit earlier. Um, we're covered in skin. That's what humans are. And most mammals, um, all mammals, anyway. Um, not all of our skin is the same. The skin on the palm of our hands needs to be dry. Generally speaking, if I put my hands in water for 24 hours, they're gonna be pretty gross. That being said, the skin on the inside of our mouth needs to be moist. And if you open your mouth for more than an hour, heck, more than five minutes, it's going to be really uncomfortable. And this is very much the same with bark. There's bark that should be at the top of the, uh, above ground, and the bark for the roots should be below ground and consistently moist. What happens when we volcano mulch is the bark that's supposed to be above ground gets wet, it stays wet, fungi get in there, insects get in there, and it can really, 
confuse the tree to into thinking, oh, okay, I've fallen down, I've, I, I must be underground, and it can start putting out roots in those volcano mulch areas, which actually can affect the long-term stability of the tree as well. So please don't volcano mulch. And then finally, string trimmers around the base of trees, it's, very, it's a very common killer of young trees, and even trees that are fairly large, like 10 or 15 years old, we still see it in some places. There's a, there's a watering truck. So this is actually from, uh, from when I was up in, uh, up in Ottawa working for the NCC. Uh, this is how we would get trees watered in areas that really don't, they're not street side, right? This is, uh, this is woodlot recovery. And this is after a, a particularly uh, significant, uh, I don't know if we'd call it a hurricane, but a weather event or derecho, something like that. It was, it was quite, quite intense, lost a swaths of forest and and so this is the replanting but the thing is is that you can't just replant you have to water them and uh it's it's important to note and for those of you who are in the northern side of burlington um you need to know what kind of soil you have because that's going to inform your watering too there's a little shot of mycorrhizal fungi right so they're symbiotic they aid in the uptake of phosphorus which is an important chemical it's called a macronutrient uh, also other macronutrients are nitrogen phosphorus and uh, potassium, those are the three big ones, NPK. And success is based on the species, both the plant and the fungus. There's a few products that exist out there that you can purchase. Um, Mike, M-Y-K-E is one of them. There's another one called Root Rescue, and there's, there's several more. Um, planting with mycorrhizal fungi is the smartest and easiest thing that you can do for your money. I strongly encourage everybody to consider this. It doesn't cost a lot for a, for a case and use as much of it as you as you can, especially if you're doing several plantings, um, because it's it works and you're putting it. It's not like a fertilizer where you're adding something that that's ephem that's ephemeral that's going to disappear in a little while. You're putting something in the soil that's going to live there. These organisms live in on and around the trees. In in depending on the species, some of them actually grow in between the cells of the roots and into the cells of the roots where they trade nutrients. Like mycorrhizae are fascinating. If you asked a scientist 15 or 20 years, actually probably 20 to 25 years ago now um, about mycorrhizal fungi, the, the general consensus was about 5% of trees had mycorrhizal associations and it was a bit of an a strange thing. And then over the last 25 years, it's been like, oh no, it's actually the opposite. 95% of species have mycorrhizal associations and the 5% of species that don't, they're either, they either are believed to not have been discovered yet, like the, the associations, or they're kind of odd, um, odd ones out ecologically in, in extreme zones or something like that. Um, there is a really good example of, this is a Sulis americanus. So uh, this one right here, Right, you see this one is day one, this is day two. They change very quickly. And so when I talk about uh, identification, I always say to folks, you know, you, you, you need to see the fungus when it's growing, when it's changing. And you have a, such a really, a really short window to actually see that. But when you're IDing, it's really important because you wanna know what you're looking at. Uh, this right here, this is actually, uh, also fungi growing on the bark of this tree. Now this could be something that's actually, uh, that's a sign of, of an infection, like a canker, which is a faction that's, that's eating the cambium. Um, or it could be a sign of a, an organism that's just living on the bark. Um, but you wanna watch out, like if it's covered, um, that's something you wanna avoid because eventually it can lead to something like this, which this is a, a canker that's really, uh, it's, it's been there for a long time and this tree's going to be living with it for the rest, rest of its life. Um, and that can, that can actually drastically shorten the life of the tree. And this is one of the reasons why we ask people not to do, use string trimmers, because you use a string trimmer, you enter the tree, you invite fungi like this, and then it leads to this damage, which is uh, both unsightly and, and just sad, you know, the tree's going to die. Um, here's another example. This is that, uh, that tree from, uh, from Melbourne. And you look on the, the right-hand side, same those black dots, those are actually fungal fruiting bodies called parathesia. They're like a, a very distant cousin to the mushroom. And uh, finally, new tree planting. So when you're planting a tree, this is, uh, 
this is information we're actually looking to, to post on our website. For folks who are coming to the tree giveaway, uh, you're going to be provided with a pamphlet much like this. Um, basically just discusses where or how you're planting your tree. Um, now, the big thing to note here that I always like to point out, you see the size of this root ball? It's supposed to be one, um, one and a half times the size of the actual hole, right? So 60% um, on one side, 60% on the other side, or 70%, just so that the tree has a lot of room to actually grow. And one common mistake I find a lot of people make is they actually take really, really good soil they dig that hole and they're like, my tree is going to get the best soil ever. And they dig really, really good. They put really, really good soil in this hole they've dug. And it's completely different than the soil in the that's actually in their backyard. And then I get a call when the tree's five, six, seven years old. And they say, the tree hasn't grown. I don't know what's going on. The tree's the same size. We get out there and what happens is that the tree has, the say the soil here is excellent, the tree will hit the roots there, get to the edge of the, the hole and say, well, why would I wanna go out this area? That soil sucks. I'm just gonna turn around and go right back on the other side and grow over here. And then it hits the wall again. And it's like, oh no, that's, that's more crappy soil. And so it turns around and it goes back over this way. And you, you do that for five or six or 10 roots, major structural roots the tree actually starts to run out of space and it uses all of the best nutrients in that spot. And by the time it actually uses all of the nutrients, it has nowhere for those roots to grow. And so the tree either dies or it stops growing and it turns into a little bonsai and uh, which is great if that's what you want to do. Um, but most people don't, <laughs> most people want their tree to grow uh, and, and to grow fairly large. And so when you plant, it's actually important if you're going to amend the soil, don't go more than a third, right? So if you've got say 30 liters of soil that you're gonna backfill your hole with, only use 10 liters of really special fancy soil and the rest should actually be what's already there. Otherwise you'll get this problem. So I actually, yeah, I call it the, 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 the mom's basement problem, right? The, the situation, the, the environment is too good to leave. And so it doesn't. And when it doesn't leave, it doesn't grow. And so finally, what do we need to accept? And this is actually, I've got this, this slide all throughout. So um, I'm going to pause for questions at the end of this. Just what do we need to accept if we want the benefits of trees? Trees produce seeds, leaves, and flowers, right? So every tree litters. People ask this question all the time. Um, can, you get a, can you get me a tree that doesn't litter? Uh, no, I can't. Because trees, that's what they do. They're designed to grow. And they're designed to, um, well, they have to pass waste like we all do, right? And that's, that's their leaves and their flowers and their seeds. Um, trees in the urban environment will grow slowly. You can get fast growing species for sure. Um, but that's, uh, it's generally speaking, because the soil isn't great, they will grow slowly. Um, we are planting the trees, especially in the boulevard for future generations, right? We can't build big trees. It's impossible. It's easier to go to Mars than it is to build a hundred year old tree. Nobody's ever done it before but we're pretty darn close to getting to Mars. Actually, we've sent a couple rockets and things, right? So it's so far, we're, it's easier to go to Mars than it is to actually build a hundred year old tree. Um, and this is why we preserve them. This is because it takes so long to grow and you'll plant a thousand trees. And in 50 years, you're only gonna have 30 of those trees left. Well, maybe, maybe not that few, but you know, we, can, we can actually talk about the, the distribution in our canopy, how few trees are actually 90 centimeters in diameter and above. How many mass, major, major trees do we have? Not many. Okay, um, so before we get into why biodiversity matters, do we have any questions, uh, questions in the chat that people wanna fire out there? Kale, I'll let you, uh, you moderate here. Right now, we do not have any questions in the chat, but I did put a little reminder to everybody that Kyle is here and accessible and available. So please make sure you're popping those in. And I think you're just doing such a good job explaining. Um, people at the edge of their seat. Yeah, people at the edge of their seat. So <laughs> welcoming questions. I do see actually one uh, that just popped in from Rahul, um, who's asking, how does the plant grow super fast in two days? I think that was the mushroom that we were looking at. Oh, yeah. Gr a great question, Rahul. So um, fungi are, are really, really different. So we think of them 
as plants. And it, it's up until about 70 years ago, 80 years ago, the fungi were referred to as uh, non-flowering plants. But the truth is, is that they're actually their own kingdom of life. They're separate from animals, they're separate from plants, and they're separate from bacteria. They're actually a, a, an entire kingdom called fungi. And these are organisms that have different cell structures. They're made out of different biochemistry and uh, very, very widespread. Um, they don't make their own energy like uh, like plants do. That's one of the things that makes a plant a plant. That's what, what we define a plant as, right? Does the organism photosynthesize? Does it have chloroplasts? So it's things that make the plant green or the leaves green. Does it take the energy from the sun, turn it into sugar, and then grow with that? Well, if it does, it's a plant. Fungi actually can't do that. So all of their energy is actually stored in, uh, in straws, these straws called hyphae. And we're not going to go too far, too, too far into it, but I love fungi. So, you know, bear with me, folks. Um, a single strand, that's called one hypha, right? And you start to get more and more and more of them. And uh, together, the plural is called hyphae. And when you get tons and tons of them, it becomes something called a mycelium. And a mycelium is the whole body of all of those hyphae coming together and bonding. And it's, it's like an underground network. Um, some, some scientists have compared it to a neural network like our brains. And you, you look at the way um, your, your synapses grow. If you ever look at a map of that and you look at a mycelium, uh, you'll understand like there's, it's, it's very interesting how they, how they exist. And so just going back to uh, this here in this photo, we see all of these mushrooms, but what we don't see is all of the tiny, tiny hyphae all the way out, all the way around the tree. You can see the there's a major root of that tree there too, right? Um, and that's where they store their energy. And so when they start to grow out of the ground, like I, I picked this one on the left-hand side, right? So it couldn't grow, it was cut off from its food source, its body, essentially. And uh, this one was left for a day. And so the mycelium will start to suck. And this is why they're really good for our trees too. Fungi are better at getting water than plants are because they're smaller. And so these little hyphae right here can go way further from the root. So if the tree is at this point right here, right? Um, the tree's roots are gonna stop uh, you know, add the drip line a little bit beyond. I mean, tree roots can get quite, quite far away, but that's another, another kettle of fish. Um, the hyphae can get quite far and suck up a ton of water. And so when you have one of those that starts growing, they're using all of their stored energy to start growing this mushroom and all of the water that's all around them, which is often why you see them after, um, after a storm. And that actually, that photo I included earlier was after a storm. They, they are so full of water. And even the fungi that you get at the store are 90%. Um, so I hope that answers your question and probably a little bit more. Um, so why does biodiversity matter? Uh, this is one, so we're gonna move moving right along. Um, why biodiversity matters? So we've got a lot of things on our plates here. Um, invasive species, risk mitigation, pest control, taxpayers' dollars, right? That's always something. And, and aesthetic value. Um, it costs a lot of money to maintain trees. It, it is a very tough profession. Uh, it's a tough trade. We don't have enough people in the trade. So if you know anybody who's interested, I'd be happy to speak with them. Um, we, and, and it's really dangerous work, uh, for, just from a cost perspective. But then talking about from a invasive species perspective, the EAB problem um, is utterly heartbreaking. So we have, just kind of what we've seen, and, and I think this is no news to anybody, right? How it starts, you have your trees try, starting to decline, and then we have to take the tree down further because there's not much left. And then eventually we're left with a stump, a lot of stumps, a lot of stumps that take a lot of work to get rid of. And this is the, the challenge when you have a, a limited pot and a lot of ash trees you have to prioritize something. And in this case, in the case of the city of Burlington, we've prioritized risk mitigation, which is cutting down a lot of the trees. Um, when EAB hit Burlington, ash trees were our number one species. 
uh, the most widely planted, 15% of our canopy was ash and it's cost over $10 million. Um, not to mention the, the, just the impact of property value, not to mention just the emotional and psychological impact of losing just beautiful trees and, and not, not only beautiful trees, but really valuable infrastructure assets, right? Really like all of these are giant sump pumps that help to stop our, our, our city from flooding. And I, you know, I think it's quite curious that we had this massive flood and there's a lot of issues with that flood. Um, but this was at the time when we had lost a lot of ash trees as well um, on our streets. And ash trees were our, our most populous species of tree and our biggest tree in a lot of areas before they got taken down. And, uh, and so how are we preventing this problem? We need to prevent it through species diversity. Um, Unfortunately, this is what we look, look like right now. We're actually more exposed. We're exposed to more risk now at the city than we were before EAB because one of the major parts of our, our, of our pie disappeared almost overnight. And so now our canopy is comprised of 31% maple species. Uh, actually, more recently, it's probably closer to 30 because we've been trying to shrink that number. And, uh, and what that means is if there's a pest that focuses on maples, we're not looking at $10 million anymore, we're looking at 20 or $25 million and losing all of these trees, right? We have 80,000 trees that are in our, uh, in our asset management software. So that's 8,000, 16,000, 24,000 trees that would just disappear um, if an invasive pest came across the border. And there is an invasive pest that is right across the border in upstate New York that focuses on maples. And so we are really concerned about increasing this biodiversity. And this is where planting native is important and uh, planting a diversity of species. We, we really try and stay away from maples now because of that risk. Um, and our current genus distribution for 2021, you can see is a very, very big list. We want a dartboard. We don't want a pizza pie. Um, you can see Quercus was a big one. That was a big one for 2021. We've dialed back on Quercus. And so I saw a question somewhere out there. Um, folks were asking about uh, sycamores. Love sycamores. That's actually one that we're really pushing now. It's one of the most widely planted um, urban trees across the planet. I've seen it in Spain. I've seen it in Britain. I've seen it in Australia and in Hong Kong. It is a great tree. Um, and throughout the states, like it, it does well with a lot of issues. It, it has it has its quirks, but every tree does. Um, just a point before I move forward, 30, 20, 10. Um, so that is a that is a rule we kind of it's not the it's a rule of thumb, but the idea is is that no more than 30% of one genus, 20% um, of one species, and 10% of one cultivar. I actually think that's a little bit rich. I'd rather have 15% maximum because as you can see, like we've talked about, it's already 15% has already burned us. Um, but uh, but that's, that's still sort of the rule of thumb that a lot of municipalities, a lot of professionals kind of go with is 30, 20, 10. Um, okay, how do we select trees? So based on experience, evidence-based practice, scientific research. Sometimes we find things out at conferences like, oh, this is a really good tree to plant. You got to plant this tree. Okay, awesome. Or you know, we've, we're actually finding that even though this one's really popular, it's vulnerable to this pest or disease. We want to avoid planting it in too high numbers or this species doesn't do well here, but it does really well there. Um, if a tree has been selected, so we've looked at a lot of these things, um, all of them. So street salt, some trees are better at side streets than they are at main streets because the road salt is really intense. Other trees do great with road salt. Um, how big do they grow, right? We don't want to grow a plant a massive growing tree under hydro lines. What's the genus, right? Because when it comes to healthcare for plants, we really actually want to stay within the genus because most pests can jump um, across species. So to give everybody an example here, we've got a bunch of different maple leaves. Um, you've got your red, your Freeman, right, which is a, a crossover, and your, uh, your silver. But these are all different species in the same genus right, if that makes sense. And sometimes trees can um, cross pollinate and uh, create hybrids in, within the genus, which is exactly what the Freeman maple is. So folks who are asking about autumn blaze, which is a common question, autumn blaze is actually a red maple and a silver maple cross. Fun fact, in case you didn't know. 
Uh, what's the root system look like? So uh, is it going to be a particularly problematic root system? Is it going to be a really valuable root system? Because uh, a willow is a really, really good tree to put in a place where we need to avoid flooding or we need to suck up a lot of water. Great for woodlots, great for creek blocks, not great for, you know, for those of you who live in the Orchard or Alton, not a great place for a willow. Really tight there, not a great deal of green space. Those roots are gonna get everywhere. Um, sight lines are important too, right? So we can't plant within a certain area based on the Ministry of Transport. Uh, we can't just put a tree right in front of a stop sign. That's an accident waiting to happen. Uh, shade, local, local and municipal biodiversity, which we've just talked about, stormwater redirection, which we've just talked about, and uh, the soil type and volume. So your, uh, your more riverine trees, like your uh, silver maple, your, your Freeman maple, your sycamore, they do well in, uh, in tough soil. Excuse me. So what are we planting right now? Uh, we're planting sycamore, swamp white oak, cucumber magnolia, red bud, and ironwood. These are ones that I, I've talked about before. Um, we're still really pushing these. There's a couple that I, our red bud is really getting out there. The word's getting out, which is great. Um, but, uh, but cucumber magnolia, swamp white, sycamore, it's actually sycamore is pretty good. People use sycamore a lot now, which is nice. Um, cucumber magnolia, though, is quite rare. And it's too bad because it's a, it's a native tree. It's native to the Carolinian forest, which is where we are right now. Um, it's, uh, and as the climate changes, cucumber magnolia will become better suited to Burlington and Southern Ontario, because we all know that it's getting hotter, uh, like it or lump it. Um, but ideally, uh, we are planning for that, right? And one of the ways that we can do that is by planting trees that are still native to this environment, but native to the more southerly piece. Um, as I just mentioned, we are part of the Carolinian forest. We're actually in the northern edge of the Carolinian. Um, goes all the way down to the states and the Carolinas, right? So Northern Carolina, Southern Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Virginia, and, uh, and all the way up into uh, New York State. And so as it gets warmer, trees that are more used to the warmer weather, like red bud and cucumber magnolia, swamp white oak, will actually become better suited to our environment here. And so there's your sycamore, which also looks quite like a maple. Um, so sometimes people ask us if they, they ask for a maple and we'll say, well, how about a sycamore? Because it looks, has a similar aesthetic, but biologically speaking, it is, it does not have the same pests or diseases. Uh, swamp white oak. So swamp white oak is, I just talked about riverine species or uh, swamp species. They do well in tough soil. They've actually been planted at the 9-11 monument in, uh, in New York. Uh, which is a, an area very, very tough to grow trees because it's just urban disaster zone, right? You've got concrete, you've got not great drainage, you've got not great soil, a lot of tourists, people hanging their hats and bikes and things like that on the tree, uh, which is a common problem we have. Uh, but they do well, right? They do well in those, those tough environments. Uh, this is a cucumber, or this is a, a cucumber magnolia on this side. Uh, which is that's the cucumber fruit. These flowers are actually from a saucer magnolia. So a lot of people ask this question. They say, oh, cucumber magnolia, is that the one with the nice pink flowers? No. So uh, a cucumber magnolia actually looks more like a tree. Um, it is the, it's considered the tree magnolia and uh, it, it'll have yellow and green flowers that kind of pop up sporadically over the course of the season. And then its fruits look like cucumbers. Beautiful smell to it, beautiful tree overall, relatively uh, soft wooded but uh, that's typical of most magnolias. This is your red bud. These are becoming quite common, which is really nice to see. Um, important point to note about red buds. So we talked about structure earlier. Um, red buds are, are quite healthy. They're members of the legume family. So they actually can fix nitrogen, but uh, which, which is really good for the soil, right? They'll, they'll, bond, uh, they'll bond with, instead of fungi, uh, bacteria. But uh, the flip side, the downside to red buds is that their, their unions are really prone to growing included bark, which means they're much more prone to branch failure and breakouts. And if you have a red bud, I encourage you to learn how to prune or hire an arborist to help you. Remember, it's always easier and cheaper to prune with a small tool than it is with a big tool. If I have to get out the big, great big chainsaw, it's, it's costly, right? Whereas if I can show up with a little pair of, of hand secateurs or a, a little pole pruner or a set of loppers, it's a lot easier for, for me and it's a lot cheaper for you. And finally, 
you've got the ironwood, which is one of my favorite trees. Uh, they grow quite slowly. They were, we're trying to plant them under hydro. They're, they're sensitive to salt, which is the downside. So they do, they do fairly well in parks. They do well in side streets and areas where the boulevards where there's more uh, soil and they're a good small tree alternative. So a, a, an ironwood can get to 50 and 60 feet, but it takes a really long time. And in the urban environment, we just don't see that. So sometimes people will say, oh, what are you talking about? This is a giant tree. It's like, it's gonna take years to get to 15 feet. Right. And then as it gets there, pruning it is a lot easier because it grows so slowly, you don't have to prune it as frequently. So for those of you who are who are getting ironwoods in the future, who have ironwoods, it's worth uh, it's worth noting. It's a nice tree because it's it's also easier on your pocketbook that way. Um, interesting point to note here as well is uh, it's one of its nicknames is hop horn bean because the fruits look like hops and uh, its wood was used for uh, for oxen for yolks. Uh, hornbeam, very tough. Okay, so this is our next uh, our next little break here. How are we looking? Oh, geez, there's a couple in the chat, eh? Yeah, we have, um, there's lots of things in the chat. We have uh, about five or six questions um, submitted, but we also have the previously submitted questions. So I would say we have about 10 lined up, ready to go. Perfect. Okay, let's, uh, let's go through. Oh, there's a, and there's a couple, uh, Low hanging fruit here. Okay, Andrew, um, is it true that each tree ring represents one year or is that a myth? Uh, that is true. So important thing to note about, uh, <laughs> about tree rings, that it is a part of the, the color change. You actually get the spring growth and then you get the summer growth. So, so the spring growth is really, really fast. You've got bigger cells because the cells are growing really quickly because there's a lot of water and uh, you're usually getting good, uh, a good movement in the in the cambium and in the tree and then as things get hotter and the summer gets harder the uh, the growth slows which is where you get that dark coloration from uh, palm trees don't have that interestingly enough because they don't grow rings they grow very differently they actually are more closely related to grass than they are to trees um okay next one we have seen many parking lots around the world with great tree plantings any chance that you and COB can encourage developers and COB to plant trees in these heat absorbing areas. Yes, please, thank you. So urban infrastructure, great question. Trees, we're trying to use trees as infrastructure. Now, part of it is this is my, my sort of compromise, my fern gully compromise to say like, please you know, plant trees in these places. Let's just not let them turn into concrete wastelands. But the flip side of it, the actual benefit of this is trees extend the life of concrete by shading them. Right, if you concrete that's getting the crap kicked out of it, pardon my French, um, all day, every day in the hot summer sun, it is going to degrade. And the idea is with trees, they actually help to, to shade. So shaded streets, for example, end up having a longer life cycle than non-shaded streets. Um, now, the question about encouraging developers, we try, and this is, uh, this is a real challenge. And part of it is just because of the bureaucratic red tape. Um, the, the way it works right now, oftentimes, is that they'll, they have a responsibility to replant. And the question always comes up, okay, we don't have a lot of space, we're just going to plant 15 trees here. And it's like, well, hold on. There's not enough room to plant 15 trees. There's not enough room to plant three trees. It's like, okay, well, we, you know, what are we going to do? And, and that's, that's often the, the important part of like, coming when we come to the table, as it were, um, it's really important that we get to the table at the beginning of the process, because oftentimes when we get the call, it's, oh, by the way, this building's done, we just need you to have a quick look at it. And it's like, well, where's the trees going? They're there and there. It's like, well, there's no room for the trees to grow. Well, there's no room, there's nowhere else to put them. And then we end up holding up the project and people say, well, how can we holding up the project? It's like, well, we, we just found out about the project. We've only been involved in this for a week. How long have you guys been talking about this? <laughs> Oh, years. Oh, okay. Well, no, we didn't know about it. We're trying to figure out a solution and we could have had this solution years ago. Um, that is that is sort of the dilemma. Um, the other point to this too, and this is what we're really pushing for is these things called silva cells. So this is a structural soil cell. And this is where in places where you have these, uh, in cities where you have trees growing, usually what's happened is either there's infrastructure that's built for people and not for cars that's important uh, it's a lot easier to grow trees in a place where people are walking and not where there are cars driving um, and then similarly it's a lot easier to grow trees in an area where you have good soil and so 
oftentimes when we have these development conversations, we say, instead of planting 18 trees and having only one of them survive, let's be honest with ourselves and invest the money that we put in planting 18 trees, plant two trees and plant them well. Let's get good soil in, let's build the underground for the tree and let's work with our infrastructure instead of working against it. And in, in circumstances like that, that's where we see success. And it, it takes a long time, but residents, anybody, anybody who actually wants to see this happen can make it happen. And, and we're trying to get there. Um, thank you for asking that question. Hey, Kyle. Um, so yes. we actually have the pre-submitted questions, which technically came in before these. Uh, oh, let's get those. I want to get the pop questions. question. Yeah, <laughs> yes, there's some good questions in here. And then just a note uh, that somebody had put a um, question in that just said service berry um, without much detail around that. So if you happen to be part of this call and that was your question, if you can just um, uh, explain a little bit more about what that question is around service berries and submit that into the Q&A, we will um, ask Kyle to cover that. Um, and the next question that we got here um, was um, pruning an old birch tree. When is the best time as this person is worried about losing too much sap? Great question. Okay, so um, I, I love this question because I actually have, um, my wife and I live, live out in the, in the boonies. Um, we have a, a massive birch tree, a bunch of trees, including a, a small pawpaw orchard that we planted. So. Uh, the, the question is very timely, um, but we, we did a reduction. I did a reduction on my birch um, back last spring and I, I swear by it. The thing to keep in mind though, is when you're pruning and this is really, really important, especially if it's an old tree, you don't prune it from the inside out. That's a big no, no. And, and unfortunately we've been trained that how you prune a young tree is how you prune an old tree. And just like we talked about before, um, raising a baby is not the same thing as caring for the elderly. They're two very different types of science and the practices are very different because you're dealing with a different organism. And so when you're dealing with a mature birch tree, it's very important to remember smaller cuts, not bigger cuts and cuts from the outside, not from the inside. So that's reduction pruning. So this is taking a tree that's supposed to be gigantic or that is rather mature and saying, okay, you're a little bit too tall. I'm not really comfortable with you. But instead of actually just getting rid of the whole tree, which is, you know, that's, a, that's always an option. Um, we say, let's just reduce the height. So if we can take something, you know, the tree is, get my little uh, pointer out here, actually. This is just so timely. We're talking about managing mature trees. It's like the next one on the list. Um, so if you have, uh, say this is our thing, we've got a little house here. Um, tell I didn't go to school for art. And uh, this is our, our big, beautiful birch uh, with included bark union. Um, but we were getting concerned about it being this big. It's instead of going and cleaning out the branches that are in the interior, you don't want to do that. You actually want to um, take the branches that are at the top. Uh, so think of it like this. If you have one cut that's 20 centimeters in diameter, that's really hard for a tree to close. That is a big wound and it will never close it. And if it's a tree like a birch, they're not really good compartmentalizers. So it's gonna be exposed to decay and it will decay at a faster rate than most trees. Whereas if you prune at the tips and you're pruning all of this off, literally like a haircut, um, you are going to help extend the valuable life of the tree. You're going to limit the leverage on the tree, right? The base of the tree has to take all of the wind. And all of a sudden, if you take some of that height down, right? It's just like how if we're trying to balance on something, we get a little bit lower. That lower center of gravity is really helpful for the tree. Um, now, I know the concern about the sap, but you're if you prune the tree in springtime, what's going to happen is the sap is actually going to start to run out and it will, it will run out of those wounds, but it actually helps seal those wounds. And so if you're, if you've got a lot of those small wounds, so like I said, one 20 centimeter cut, that's stressful for a tree, but 10, two centimeter cuts, far easier for a tree to manage because the surface area is a lot, um, is a lot easier to cover, right? Because there's all of that um, that cambium around the uh, the wound. So you think about this, like all of this cambium here versus this. This is 
this is probably not the best, <laughs> best expression here, but um, I hope that makes sense. And just to give you an example, this is not what I'm talking about. So this is topping. This is not appropriate, uh, generally speaking, appropriate care of a mature tree. However, these are poplars and this is in the middle of uh, Asiatic Russia. And that's really the only tree that they can grow there other than large trees. And so this is how they manage it. You know, we wouldn't call it to ISA standard, um, but it's a way to manage trees. Um, I really suggest um, hiring an arborist for a reduction prune or doing a reduction prune on your birch, uh, because then you're going to extend the valuable life of your tree. Uh, and doing it early spring, uh, May through, uh, May, uh, pardon me, March through May, great time to do it. Um, Amazing. Thank you so much. These <clears throat> questions are blowing my mind and your answers are too. Um, yeah, well, great questions. I love them. Great questions. And I don't know if you all are enjoying Kyle's artwork as much as mine. <laughs> images are actually really, really helpful. Um, so thank you for the added touch there. Um, the point. next question that we have is, I think the one you're most excited about. So how to successfully plant a grove of two-year-old pawpaw seedlings from containers? And they're looking for specifically like location and spacing, et cetera. Okay, um, so pawpaws, for those who don't know, uh, pawpaws are a native fruit tree. Uh, there used to be heaps of them. They were got rid of uh, because they didn't have a great commercial value, uh, which is a real shame because apparently they're delicious. I don't know. I've lived here my whole life. They're native to this area, but they, they don't really exist. Um, so kudos to the, the person who's planting them. Thank you. Let's get some pawpaws out there. Um, they are otherwise known as Indian mango or custom custard banana, um, but they, uh, they don't last as long as apples or pears. And apples and pears are a really good commercial crop. So that's what everybody grows. Um, it's an interesting point, and this isn't the conversation for it, but to talk about how mass agriculture uh, does affect our diets significantly as much as they as mass agriculture affects our forests and our trees. Um, it's, it's wild. But, uh, but getting back to the pawpaw, they are uh, partial, uh, partial shade. I have, I have planted them in full shade, partial shade, full sun, and partial shade really is the best. Um, and that means for the first couple of years, especially if they're small, like container stock, baby them, put tomato cages around them so that you don't trip over them in winter time, wrap them when you get to winter. Those first five years of the tree's life are really important and they're the toughest. The first year is all after planting is super, super tough. And then every successive year after that, um, give yourself for, if you're, if you want to have a, a, an orchard experience. Now, bear in mind, I'm an arborist, not an orchardist. That is a whole other line of work, believe it or not. Um, but, uh, but we want to look at planting trees three meters apart, generally speaking. Um, you can plant them closer if you want to go for a specific effect, right? So we, so at our planting events, we'll do one to one and a half meters um, or even tighter because the idea is, is that some are going to fail, right? Some are going to die, some are going to survive. And the ones that do survive, they're going to compete and they're going to get taller faster. That's actually kind of the goal of tight spacing. If you want to have an orchard style, planting them three meters apart, is going to give them a lot of room to grow um, and to get large. Bear in mind, the flowers are, are um, they're a little unpleasant, like the smell isn't great. People don't like them, uh, but I, uh, you're, it's an orchard, right? Like this is, it's part of the, the fun of the place. Um, I wouldn't plant them right next to your bedroom window, you know, there's food for thought, but otherwise um, mulch is really important. If you can get mulch from the back of a tree truck, willow, uh, willow bark mulch especially is like fantastic um, and sugar water. So for, for the person out there asking about the, the trees, especially when you're planting them, um, don't prune them. That's the other thing. Don't prune them for the first three or four years. Really, just let them figure themselves out. Let them grow. Let them be, you know, it's like the child. Like, let it just run and figure, figure out the world. Um, and once it gets a little bit more mature, that's when you start the training. Once it's put on some wood and you, you choose the directions, um, always prune back to proper unions, right? Don't do that to your pawpaws you're going to have a bad time um, if you do. And, uh, and so, yeah, that, I think that's a good way to go. Oh, sugar water. Um, so 
in 10 liters of water, you want one cup of sugar and that's your over the counter. And the whole idea is it's meant to feed the roots and to feed the, uh, the microbiota in the soil because a healthy soil is a biologically active soil. You want a lot of organisms in there, breathing, moving, eating, pooping, all of that to help the tree, um, the tree roots get settled because the more interaction that you're gonna have, the ease, generally speaking, um, pests excluded, obviously, uh, it's gonna be easier for the tree to get established. So I hope that that kind of sums it up. Um, burlap, uh, wire baskets around or ca tomato cages when they're young. Uh, don't prune them for the first three to five years and uh, proper mulch and sugar water. There you go. Amazing. Thank you so much. And a reminder for everyone that we are recording this. So even uh, Kyle has a lot of information and he's sharing them, but you can always go back and listen to these answers again. So we're going to try and get as many questions answered and Kyle is shooting out this information, but it will be eternally living on our YouTube page. Um, so the next question is, fig, uh, fig plum planting in zone 10A, does that make sense to you? It, <laughs> it kind of does, yeah. Okay. Um, so we are in zone, I wanna say 6A. I, I always get hung up on this and this is kind of embarrassing. Can somebody Google it? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. try and, uh, there we go, okay. Um, Burlington zone. Oh, that doesn't help me at all. Um, okay, we'll go back to the power. There it comes. Planting. Yeah, a six, it's saying six B right there. Um, so 10, 10 is like warm. That's like Southern, um, more southerly. And, and I don't think we'll ever get there. I think we'll get up to zone seven, maybe at worst zone eight. And if we're at zone eight, oh boy, um, that's going to be a whole other kettle of fish. But, uh, but zone 10 trees, growing them here, if you're growing them in a pot, that's one thing. And, and figs, it's interesting that you, you talk about figs because there are some interesting, there are great podcasts out there about them. Um, now, for those out there who, are, who don't know, uh, figs, obviously there's the fruit, but uh, Fig trees, ficus is the actual Latin genus. So you've probably heard of ficus. Ficus and figs are the same thing. Uh, they, they get bloody massive, absolutely massive. In some places in the world, they actually, um, there are strangler figs, which is another species of fig that actually will grow around a tree. Some of you have seen them uh, relatively, uh, they're a common sight in like Cambodia, the Indian subcontinent, um, uh, the Middle East and, uh, and they're planted, I think they're introduced in, uh, in Australia as well. I don't know if they're native there. But uh, if you're talking about for fruits and, and the, the interesting ones with the interesting leaves, growing them in a pot, when you get to uh, winter time, you got to move them inside, keep them in a, in a dark room, like uh, downstairs bathroom, not a joke. That's actually what you should do um, if you want to have them any level of productive. But a 10A plant in, in Ontario, if it's not in a pot, good luck. It's not going to happen. Thanks so much. Next question is, um, <clears throat> and just quoting the question here, recently I've come upon a couple of specimens of amazing sycamore trees locally. They seem so hardy, full, and dependable. Are they, and why are there not more of these about town? Great question. Okay, um, so two-part question. Sycamores, amazing, 100% agree. I am the, I'm the sycamore pusher. Uh, Welcome. Uh, I, I love them. I think they're great trees, beautiful bark. I think one of the things is a, a misunderstanding. Um, when I was working privately years ago, I, uh, I had a, a client call and say, hey, we, we just moved into a new house. We want to see if you could inspect the trees. And this was right at the height of EAB. And I was like, do you have ash trees? And they're like, no, 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 we wouldn't have bought a house with ash trees. Um, I go, okay. And they went out there and they did have ash trees, unfortunately, six of them. And it was a five figure um, job after purchasing their home. They didn't expect. It's like buying your house and finding out that you need to replace your roof, right? Um, and it was, a, it was an aspect of the landscape that they loved. It sucks. Um, but I, we, we were in the process of chatting. They were like, oh, you know, we were looking at another house. We didn't want to buy that tree because the tree just looked, or the house because the tree just looked sick out front. I said, what do you mean? And they said, oh, well had this really un weird looking patchy bark and I was like oh that's a sycamore yep no that's how they they you know it's a sycamore because it looks sick easy way to remember 
Um, it has exfoliating bark, one of our few trees that actually has exfoliating bark, and it is a riverine uh, species. It does have a few issues when it comes to anthracnose, which is like a, a bacterial, fungal, or, or pest disease. And anthracnose is basically when the tree, uh, I think like, uh, like a spider, like it'll have a ton of these at the tips of its leaves. It'll basically have like this weird sort of broom of branches. Uh, you get that a lot next to uh, salt as well. So highway trees will, will grow witches, uh, pardon me, will get anthracnose or grow witches brooms in response to uh, chemical poisoning. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know why they're not as popular or they weren't as popular in Burlington. I think it may be because of ash trees and, and just a case of forest planning. Um, this position that I'm in right now hasn't existed for more than 10 years. I believe uh, forest planning and, and forest health were uh, just not aspects that were really well understood across the continent, not just Burlington, but across the continent up until I think this last uh, invasive species epidemic, because it's really kind of hit everybody on the head like, oh no, these things cost a lot of money. It takes a lot to maintain. And if we're going to grow these things, right? Can't go to Mars, can't build an 80 year old tree, can't grow a city of thousands of 80 year old ash trees and then have them disappear overnight like that's devastating um and so here we have you know the talks of biodiversity but i think that that's actually one of the reasons why we don't see enough sycamores around the city because there wasn't that sort of robust planning there wasn't that tracking of the inventory or even an inventory at all up until about 25 years ago i believe and so and some municipalities in ontario don't have inventories at all so they don't know what kind of trees they have when they plant trees they don't know if they're planting for biodiversity they're trying to plant for biodiversity bearing in mind that they don't have the hard evidence, which is really tough, right? It's really tough to work that way. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, go Sycamore. Yeah, all of these have been excellent answers. Um, the next question is, I've been reading about the spotted lanternfly and the devastating effects it can have on our orchard crop. Apparently the tree of heaven is its best hope. Given the severe impact this insect has, how can the message get out about removing this tree from private and public property? Great question. So for those who don't know, let me just go back to a little bit shy. Uh, hey, there we go. Um, okay, so this is spotted lanternfly. It is uh, terrifying to me and my colleagues. Uh, it's quite pretty. Uh, which, you know, um, well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Some people are probably like, ugh. Um, but it is an invasive pest. It came over on landscape stones. These are what the, uh, oh, Lordy Lordy. Um, these are egg casts right there. So you can see how they've kind of, uh, they fly under the radar. And these are egg casts on a tree of heaven, I believe. Um, now, it's, this is, the, this is a great question because it's like, okay, so do we get rid of all the tree of heaven? Well, that is a whole other kettle of fish because that's, now we're talking about removing thousands of trees, um, probably about 750 trees, which is a big cost when they do still provide an infrastructure benefit, right? And so for myself as a planner, this, this goes right back to the last question of why aren't there any sycamores? It's like, well, why, why do we have tree of heaven? Well, they kind of slipped in under the radar. We don't have the funding, the resources, the time to manage that when everybody's calling us to deal with their trees and to say, okay, let's get rid of all of the tree of heaven. That is a program, right? That's like, we need to know where the trees are. We need to know how healthy they are. We need to have all of their sizes recorded. And then we need to go to tender to, to contractors. Actually, before we even do that, we need to go to council and say, this is what we want to do. It's probably going to cost us about this much. We don't know because we have to go to tender for it. And they're going to say, well, is this necessary? And we'll say, well, we're trying to prepare ourselves for this pest. It's like, well, a million dollars to take care of it or whatever it is, you know, ideally it'll support us, but we also have a laundry list of other asks. And so this is one of those things that kind of falls lower on the list. Um, I think what we, what I would really like to do is to have a monitoring program and to begin chipping away at tree of heaven. So when they, when they start to grow in a place or, or when it's time to take one down, we're not replacing it with a tree of heaven or not another non-native invasive species, right? We're not going to plant a Norway maple. We don't plant Norway maples anymore. Norway maples are invasive and we try to, we try to avoid planting them if we can help it, but we can't also get rid of all the Norways because that's like 10,000 trees in our canopy. Um, it's a, it's a sticky wicket, but I really do appreciate the question there. 
Um, I will also just use this as another plug. This one right here is the pest of maples that I was telling everybody about. That's the Asian longhorn beetle. So as you can tell, they're invasives. They come from another continent. They're either coming from Europe or they're coming from Asia. Um, in this case, spotted lanternfly. It's got the black and white dots. Um, Asian longhorn beetle also has the black and white dots. And, uh, and there's just a, a picture. This is when, when we get spotted lanternfly, Dollars to donuts, we're going to know because they they travel a lot. Um, now bear in mind, oh my little uh, my little map is gone. Oh well, uh, there's a map. There, it's it's we're it's probably going to make its way here. I hate to say it that way, but um, it's it's pretty much all across the eastern United States right now. Anyway, Kale. Yeah. So um, just checking in with time. It's eight twenty one. Um, we just need maybe like four minutes at the end to do our little wrap up. So we still have time for a few questions. Um, and I'm just going to uh, pick a few of them that I think everyone will want answered. Um, so from Andrew, are there specific mycorrhizal fungi you should plant for trees? Do different species need different fungi? Great question, Andrew. So different species uh, yes, like they do build relationships. Um, there's this really interesting case in, uh, in New Zealand, actually, of an invasive species complex of our native species. So there's a, there's a vole from the West Coast, there's the Douglas fir, and then there is a, uh, a bolete species of fungi, a mycorrhizal one, that, uh, that all three of them actually combine in the native environment to support each other, right? So the, uh, the vole plants the Douglas fir, the Douglas fir grows, creates a home for the mycorrhizae, the mycorrhizae helps the Douglas fir, the Douglas fir helps the mycorrhizae, the vole eats the, the mycorrhizae fungi, poops it out all over the place and helps the mycorrhizae spread, thus providing home for the Douglas fir, which also feeds the, you guys get the picture. Um, that, uh, that is very much the case with, with all species. Now, there are some generalists. Um, if you're talking about products, so uh, to give you an example, Mike is a one species or two species product, I believe. I don't quote me on this. Um, and then Root Rescue is a multi-species product. And uh, I, I prefer to see different species just because I don't know what connects either. And part of it is it's really hard to know. Like scientifically speaking, like you got to take these things out. You got to get them under the microscope. You got to do DNA analysis. It's really complicated. Um, so generally speaking, the understanding is if we see a species of fungus, we as in like, you know, the scientific community, which I really don't speak for, but you know, bear that in mind. Um, if, a, if a species is spotted with a tree, the general understanding is, okay, that is, they have a, a mycorrhizal association. And if we do a hike in the future, which I, you know, plant that seed, especially a fungi hike, um, it, it's, it's possible to actually dig down to the root of it, no pun intended, um, and see where the fungus connects to the tree. Moving right along. Trying to fire through them there for you, Kale. Um, thank you so much. A very important question, which I think you will love to answer, Kyle, is Adam would like to know, how do you go about becoming an arborist? Great question, Adam. Okay, so um, arboriculture is both a trade and a profession, and there are the two sides to it. I encourage everybody to start um, as an apprentice. And so that means looking up a tree company and saying, hey, I'm interested in becoming an arborist. Um, there are also three schools in the province that do college programs. So there's Humber College, there's Fleming, and then uh, Algonquin. There's also uh, Les, Les Cité de Jeunes, uh, which is in Ottawa, pardon my poor French, um, which is a, a French program. So if you're not a French speaker um, and you don't want to go all the way up to Ottawa, then you don't even need to think about that one. Um, and then there is also a, uh, a program that the ISA uh, Ontario chapter offers, which is like a, a preparatory program for arboriculture um, apprentices. So basically it's before you get into the apprenticeship, you can, uh, and I encourage you to check out uh, ISA Ontario. So the International Society of Arboriculture Ontario, um, check out the website because there's, there's a lot of great information on the industry there. Um, I encourage you get an apprenticeship uh, it's it's several years of, uh, of hard work and just learning about the industry, learning about the tools, learning about the science. And then once you've kind of got your uh, your Ontario ticket, which is your journeyman or your um, skilled tradesman ticket or tradesperson ticket, you uh, you can look at the ISA. The ISA, generally speaking, is you're looking at five years of uh 
five years of, of work experience in the green industry, and then you have to challenge an exam. You can get the, uh, the study guide from the ISA. And, uh, and if you get that, that's a great, that's really the beginning, but it's, uh, that's, that's what we kind of, that's the bar for getting into the, uh, the industry. Amazing, thank you so much. I'm gonna see if maybe we can just pop one more question here quickly. And it's from Pasandu. What happens when a new development proposal sits on a lot containing urban trees? Oh, this is like, uh, sorry, what happens if a development- What happens when a new development proposal um, sits on a lot that's containing urban trees? Okay, uh, great question. So if, if that happens, oh boy. Um, it depends on where it goes. So generally speaking, it should go to planning and it should go to forest protection. However, um, that really depends on the, the circumstances on the actual proposal. Um, and really the, the people doing it. So what I understand where our bylaw is, is that if you want to do anything like that, you need to have an arborist report first and foremost. So that's the first step in the process. I mean, this is like, oh boy, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to distill this because this is a whole other conversation, which I would love to have. Um, I realized I after I, I asked you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't know. The most I'm... complicated question yeah. was like, you got 30 yeah. seconds. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so the long and the short of it is the first step when it comes to the forestry side of things is that an arborist report needs to be uh, produced. So the, the person applying for that would have to go and get uh, hire an arborist to do an inventory and a report on the work that's going to be done. So they'll have the, they'll have the, uh, the drawing, the scale drawing, right? That's the survey of the site. And then they'll have all of those trees um, identified and a whole other assessment, similar to what we actually have for the asset management inventory that I showed you earlier with all the dots. Um, but uh, they'll have details on each of the trees, what the plan is for the project, their health. Every arborist is gonna do it differently. Um, you wanna hire an arborist who knows what they're doing when they, when you're getting a, a development report at any point or an arborist report, because it's it once again it's like going to a surgeon versus going to a pediatrician versus going to a, a medical you know a cardiologist that we all even though we're all arborists we all have different skill sets and uh, a, a, an arborist report is an important document and uh, in a lot of circumstances can be considered a legal document and should be done and prepared properly by an arborist who knows what they're doing. I hope that answered the question. That's a tough one. But yeah, yeah, I, I love that. Kale's like, all right, here we go. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Kyle. If you don't thank mind, you. Um, if uh, you can stop screen sharing so I can put up a little thank you, Kyle um, section. And there was, unfortunately, two questions we did not get to today. Um, but I just want to make sure that we um, honor everybody's uh, expected closing time. Okay, did I get uh, trying to stop sharing? It's not letting me. If you scroll over to that little green bar, normally if you like highlight it, the little stop. Ah, yes. Right. There we go. Look at that. Nice. Okay, amazing. So I am going to pop this on. <laughs> So we can't have a thank you without a slide up, um, but we just wanted to say thank you so much. I'm sure all of you enjoyed this just as much as I did. I don't know about you guys, but I learned like a hundred new things um, and I'm a huge fan of all of those analogies that you were using. I felt like they really helped to drive home all of those points. So just on behalf of Burlington Green and all of our attendees, I wanted to say thank you so much to Kyle for sharing his expertise with us this evening. Um, and to do a little um, shout out for our upcoming events, um, which obviously are all nature related and directly uh, related to what we we're talking about today. So the first two, um, you can find all of this information on our website, of course, but wanted to make sure I just cover some of these things briefly if some of you didn't know they were happening. So we have a TLC event um, happening this Saturday at 9 a.m. at Tuck Park also um, with the city. So that information is available on our website. Pre-registration is required. 
Um, and it's a super fun event. Again, very educational. We'll be doing some seed ball making activities. So it's good for all sorts of different ages um, and very educational, really excellent. And uh, we'll have some direction there from Kyle, um, uh, sorry, Eric, um, one of Kyle's colleagues um, with us on the Saturday. We also have our annual tree photo contest, which will launch on Friday. So get ready to snap and submit your local tree photo and be entered into the opportunity. And we just find this is such a great, um, like artistic, wonderful community-based way that I always love seeing the images. And especially like we all sort of see these trees in our community, um, but like submitting your art pieces about them, you really get to see uh, the specialness of Burlington's trees in really beautiful ways. So I encourage all of you guys to participate in that. Um, October 15th, we are having our zero waste drive-through event. Um, our third zero waste drive through event and you'll see there we have a few different components of it um, as well as we'll have some like e-bikes there for people to check out free charging and um, there's a repair cafe inside that's free from 10 to 4 so not only can you drop off your old e-waste whether that's a old printer an old uh, laptop an old battery um, old charging cords you have no idea what they're for um, an old electric toothbrush, pretty much anything electronic we will be able to take. And it's also delightful that it is a fundraiser for Burlington Green at a certain point once we reach a weight. So if you have e-waste sitting around your house, um, save it for us and bring it to us on October 15th at Burlington Center. And you can drop all of that off as well as the stuff that they collect in their TerraCycle bins. So that's batteries, ink and toner cartridges, chip bag wrappers, snack bag wrappers, any of that crinkle wrap, Ziploc bags, plastic membership cards, all of that is available on our website. Um, our cleanup green up is, go, is uh, running as usual. Um, and you can at any time do a cleanup in Burlington. We have free cleanup supplies as always. So you can just register online. And it's really beautiful that our cleanups are all sort of connected through the community effort because you can see on the map all of the other cleanup locations that have been done locally. Um, and it's yeah, a wonderful way to contribute. Get out there with your family, your friends, your neighbors, come pick up some free supplies and clean up our community together. Um, we also have the Turkey Trot, which is coming up on Sunday, October 16th. It's a very exciting fundraiser that we're participating in for the first time where you can run, you can walk, you can, you know, skip and jump if you want. But um, it's just a wonderful fundraising event that's run by Rotary that we would really love your support with. So check that out on our website. Our youth network is amazing. Many of our attendees here this evening are from our youth network. Thank you so much for attending. It's open to anyone ages 14 to 24. All of that information is on our website. You can follow us on Instagram if you don't already. Um, and yes, there is an election approaching um, and we will have um, election resources available and we'll be posting candidate responses to our top environmental questions. Um, so that is always a helpful resource when we're looking at making decisions about who we're going to vote for in this municipal election. We are a nonpartisan organization, so we do not endorse any candidates, but we simply ask them all the same environmental questions so that we can all make educated decisions when we're at the polls um, and can just sort of look through the candidates' responses and see um, if they align with our personal views and feelings. So. Um, those are some upcoming opportunities. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, I suggest you do that. You can find Burlington Green on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're all over the place. So um, we always welcome people. Um, we just say we like to help you help the planet. So we want to provide all of these different opportunities for um, lovely folks like you who are interested and passionate and just want to know what, what we can get involved with. So thank you so much um, in advance for um, attending or sharing or helping us promote any of those events. And um, just in terms of feedback, we really appreciate hearing from our event attendees what they thought about their experience. Um, so we will send a follow-up email that will have a quick sort of survey attached to it. Um, but we're always working to work, play, plan and host the best events possible. So please give us your unfiltered feedback. We hope you enjoyed this event as much as we did. Um, and then just a quick note that uh, tonight's event was part of our Nature Friendly Burlington program, which was kindly supported by the Burlington Foundation. Um, nature Friendly Burlington is all about making the connections between local nature and people stronger, uh, knowing that the more we connect with nature, the more we appreciate it, protect it, and care for it. 
Um, thank you again to Kyle. Thank you so very much. much for joining us. And it's not just the time this evening, it is the decades of your life you have spent preparing for events like this evening. Um, and it's so important, I don't know about all of you guys when I talk about biodiversity, but I just love to see different professionals and different professional people um, just working at their niche area of interest. And um, it's it gives me great relief to know that there's people out you out there like you that are doing this work and speak the languages of the trees and can help translate that to us in English. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kale. It's a real uh, pleasure. Yes, and thank you all of you for joining us this evening and for any of you watching on YouTube in the future. Thank you for um, watching till the end of the video. Uh, we would love for you to consider volunteering with us, of course, following us across our social media platforms. Um, and uh, donations of any amount are hugely appreciated. We are a charity um, and all of the funds that we receive go directly right back into the community. And we can now provide charitable tax receipts for your donation. So um, we appreciate that so much. It helps all of the programs like this run. And um, please just check out your, um, take a keep note for the email in your inbox that will have the survey. Um, and yeah, check out our website for all of the different opportunities that we have. And thanks again so much. Um, it has been great being here with all of you. Thank you, everyone.